My name is Walter Sennett Armstrong. I teach at Duke University in the Philosophy Department and McKinnon Institute for Ethics. In this video, I want to introduce you to a revolution in philosophy called contrastivism. Now, many movements in philosophy argue for one side or the other of traditional philosophical issues. They argue that people do have free will or that they don't have free will. They argue that some acts are objectively immoral or that no acts are objectively immoral. They argue that we can know something or that we cannot know anything. The goal of contrastivism is different. Instead of solving traditional issues, contrastivists dissolve old debates by showing how these disputes depend on overly simplistic concepts. They propose a new way to understand the crucial concepts so that both sides in the old debate are right and both are wrong. They want to have their cake and eat it too when their opponents say that this is impossible. To see how contrastivism works, let's start with a simple example. Imagine that it's raining and a friend asks you why it's raining. One natural answer is that the humidity was so high that it passed a certain threshold. That explains why it's raining instead of staying dry, because it would not be raining if the humidity were lower. But now add that it's January and the person is asking why it's raining instead of snowing. In this context, a different answer becomes natural. It's raining because the temperature in the atmosphere is above freezing, since it would be snowing if the temperature were lower. Which answer is correct? The first answer was that it's raining because of the humidity. The second answer was that it's raining because of the temperature. Well, which answer is correct? The whole dispute seems pointless. The facts are obvious. It's raining instead of staying dry because of the humidity, and it's raining as opposed to snowing because of the temperature. We can avoid the pointless dispute by recognizing that humidity and temperature both cause rain, but they cause rain relative to different contrasts, dry or snow. This simple example provides a model for dissolving many traditional philosophical debates. Consider knowledge. Imagine that I take my daughter to a zoo and we both see a monkey in a cage. My daughter asks me what it is and I reply, it's a monkey. But do I really know that it's a monkey? Some philosophers say no. Other philosophers say yes. Contrastivists say both yes and no, at least after contrasts are added. They say that I know that the animal in the cage is a monkey in contrast with an ape because I can tell monkeys from apes and I see this one clearly. But what if I cannot tell a monkey from a lemur? because I've never heard of a lemur or seen a lemur. Then I do not know that the animal is a monkey in contrast with a lemur, because I cannot tell those species apart. In this case, a contrastivist says that I do know that the animal in the cage is a monkey in contrast with an ape, but I do not know that it's a monkey in contrast with a lemur. This reply always annoys critics. They retort, enough already. Do I know or not know that the animal is a monkey? Contrastivists reject that question as too simple to be answered precisely. It's like asking whether North Carolina is north or south. You cannot answer that question until you add a qualification. North or south of what? Next consider another topic in philosophy, ethics or morality. Suppose that a millionaire gives $10,000 to the charity CARE. Did she do what she ought to do? Deontologists and libertarians and some others usually say yes. But consequentialists often say no, because the millionaire should have given more. She could have given 10 times as much, $100,000, and still have had plenty left to live a good life, indeed, a much better life than other people who would have avoided disease and hunger if she had given more. So who's right? Deontologists are consequentialists. Contrastivists say that both are right in one way and both are wrong in another way. The different ways are represented by contrasts. According to contrastivists, the millionaire ought to give $10,000 in contrast with nothing, but ought not to give $10,000 in contrast with $100,000 because she ought to give $100,000 in contrast with $10,000. 
Now our critics really get angry. Enough already. Is it true or false that the millionaire ought to give $10,000? Contrastivists again reject that question as too simple to answer. Overall, the idea behind contrastivism is that philosophers get themselves all wrapped up in paradoxes and puzzles and cannot see any way out because they do not make their contrasts explicit. Contrastivists can dissolve these philosophical puzzles by specifying the contrast in each crucial claim. This lesson applies to all kinds of reasons, including reasons to do actions, like donating $10,000, reasons to believe propositions, like the proposition that the animal in the cage is a monkey, and reasons why things happen, like rain. Since so many philosophical puzzles and paradoxes are about reasons of these three kinds, contrastivism promises to dissolve a great deal of old traditional philosophical debates. It also points the way towards more constructive discussions of related issues after contrasts are added. So, join the revolution. Contrastivists of the world, unite! You have nothing to lose but your unqualified judgments.